So um, my story. So I have had um, narcolepsy, like Monica said, for decades now. Um, I was diagnosed at the age of 45, but I have had symptoms when I look back now and I know what I know now since I was um, since I was in my 20s, but I was treated for epilepsy for 20 years. So that's a little bit unique to my story. Perhaps there are other people out there um, with a similar story, but that's a big part of mine. I'm a mom of two adult kids and I have grand puppies, no grandchildren yet, but that's just a little bit about who I am. So today I've, I've told my story several times, but I've always kind of gone from beginning to where I am now. But today I wanted to do a little bit of a different um, take because there are many stories out there. So I wanted to have something uh, a little bit different. One thing that I've found over year, the years of this is that we're more alike than we are different. Uh, with the exception of medication, it seems that we're all different. <laughs> But in terms of living with this disorder, um, there's much more similarities than there are differences in what we have to deal with. I want to focus a little bit on how I've changed over the years in terms of I've been, you know, dealing with this since my 20s and early 20s, if not teens, and I'm now 60. So my perspective has changed. I've had a full career. I'm now retired. I'm actually finding myself in single again, and I've gone to school with this disorder, gone back to school, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've learned along the way, my personal reflections, and what still surprises me, and what my current challenges are, and what I'm hopeful about, because I think that that's um, a really important uh, thing we always need to have hope. So it was 25 years approximately for me to get a diagnosis. I have narcolepsy type one. My cataplexy actually ended up being my biggest um, issue. I certainly have the other things that go with narcolepsy. My sleepiness was not an obvious sleepiness. It was, um, you know, it manifested in, in the ways that my brain worked and, and um, in attention and focus and things like this, but it wasn't an obvious sleepiness until um, very close to me getting diagnosed. I've had many, many ER visits that have disrupted my work life, that have disrupted my home life. I've seen different specialists, including four neurologists over the years. And I live in Halifax. Um, I meant to mention that, which is uh, in Nova Scotia on the East Coast. My symptoms evolved, I think, over the first 10 years, which probably made it difficult to diagnose me. And I also think that I had more insight after I, you know, um, could step back and, and kind of look at what happened. But, you know, we, we can't always have a, um, you know, an accurate view when we're going through something like this. So I was told that I had textbook narcolepsy when I was diagnosed. My sleepiness, like I said, was not obvious sleepiness. I was having hallucinations, which I didn't realize were hallucinations. As the years went on, my hallucinations became more obviously hallucinations, if that makes sense. I certainly had a lot of issues with uh, kind of that sleep wake um you know, blurriness where I didn't know if I was in a dream or if I was awake, did this really happen? Did I have this discussion? And at the time I would ask my spouse, like, did, did this happen? Like, did we, did we have this discussion? Did somebody tell me this or did I dream this? And it was very real to me that I did not know. And, and he would laugh and, you know, kind of fill me in and say, no, I don't think that happened. So it can be very, um, it can be very, oh, it just, it just upsets your whole brain, you know, to be, to be that not in tune. And I'm sleep deprived today. I've only had four hours sleep, so I'm going to have some trouble word finding. So hopefully that won't be too much of a problem. My cataplexy for the most part was full body cataplexy. And if you had asked me when I was in my thirties, um, when I looked back, once at 45, I got diagnosed, but I, I looked back at all the different, um, attacks or spells I had, I would have told you that I didn't have partial and that I only had full body. Once I was diagnosed with our, um, narcolepsy and I understood cataplexy, I realized um, that there were some nuances and 
it really was not evident to me until I was retired that I had a lot of partial cataplexy. So I was so busy. I worked in a pediatric um, hospital, um, initially in acute care working, um, you know, children on ventilators and neurosurgery, neurology, very, very busy units. And then I was in a clinic for several years. The pace was very fast, which was really good for my narcolepsy because it kept me awake. I was stimulated. I was interested. I loved my job. But the downfall was that I didn't, I wasn't able to be in tune with my body. And like many healthcare professionals or people in busy jobs, it was the last thing I thought about was me. It, you know, you think about everybody else and you want to get your job done. So when I retired, I realized that I do have warning signs before my cataplexy and there are many partial cataplexies and things that lead up to full body, which has been a huge eye opener for me and very interesting. Sleep paralysis, I probably had, probably had about five times before I was diagnosed and I might have had it once or twice in the last 15 years since I've been on medication. My disrupted nighttime sleep is much more disrupted now. Um, but I also have restless leg syndrome and I go through periods where it is much worse and I have to uh, deal with that as well. So currently my restless leg syndrome is probably worse than my narcolepsy. But if you know anything about restless leg syndrome, it's a very, you know, almost involuntary or, or a, a very urgent need to move your legs at night. And it keeps me awake, which makes my narcolepsy worse. And it ends up being a vicious cycle. So. I made this graphic because, you know, as I, I talk about things um, coming up, it's really important to realize that as a person with narcolepsy or any chronic disorder, we are so many things to so many people in our lives. We are not just this island who has to look after our narcolepsy. We have to keep a job. We have to raise children. You know, we may want to volunteer. We might want to go back to school. We have personal relationships like you know, spouses and friends and extended family and responsibilities there. So just, I, I, you know, I don't need to tell anybody with a chronic disorder the impact that um, these things have on you. We're not an island. So that's basically the, the point I want to make with this. So when I was in my 20s and 30s, I knew I had a neurological problem and I was never really sold that it was seizures. And I would try to discuss with physicians kind of, um, you know, to have a deeper discussion, but, you know, it never really went any far. And certainly sleep was not discussed. And I've done whole presentations on, on um, that part of my journey. But I used to tell people that narcolepsy is a chronic neurological condition. I would really recite the textbook, you know, what I would read about. And it's lifelong and it has no cure. And I would say that I take medications to treat the symptoms. And most of the time you couldn't tell there's anything wrong with me. And I would really work hard to make sure the other person felt okay. So even before I knew I had narcolepsy, I would say, it's okay. I know I have these funny things. Somebody told you that this happened, but it doesn't happen that often. And, you know, don't worry about it. That's not a big deal. And I would worry, and I would tell people that they, um, you know, don't be afraid to be around me. If something happens, just kind of, you know, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll kind of come out of it. But it was really focused on making the other person feel better, not what my needs were. So when I was diagnosed at age 45, um, Initially, I was relieved. I was like, oh my goodness, I know what this, this is. And the medications that I were on was on compared to the anti-seizure medications, they worked. <laughs> and I was actually getting some relief and I was very hopeful. And I still didn't want to worry people. So I would say, yes, I know what it is. It's just this, it's a sleep disorder. It's not going to kill me. Um, it's something I can manage and I would really make light of it and make light of the impact. And I use humor a lot. I would laugh at myself, use de self-deprecating humor. And if I was in a situation where I was at a party or 
just, you know, somewhere that was really social and I didn't want anybody to know. And if I had, you know, some symptoms of just feeling off or one time I actually didn't realize what it was. And I know now, but I was at a party and I almost dropped a cup. And I remember the, the cup like trying to hold it and it was like sliding out of my hand and I put it on a table. And I remember like hiding, kind of turning myself so nobody could see it. But also in my head thinking, am I having a stroke? Like, you know, what's what's with that kind of thing? So I was very, um, I didn't really want to show people, although I, you know, I was out about it and I would say, yes, this is what I have, but I would make light of it and, and carry on. So 15 years after diagnosis, so I'm now 60. Um, I still tell them, and it, it really depends on the context, who the person is, how much I think they really want to know, how important is it that this person understands, you know, really anything or how much do they need to know and how much do I trust this person? And that really, that really is a factor. I kind of um, use my words, you know, depending on how comfortable I feel and how safe I feel. And that's probably the best way to describe it. But my textbook version is, yes, I have a, I have a sleep disorder. It's called narcolepsy. It's a disorder of the sleep-wake cycle. It's not curable, but, you know, there's lots of things I do to kind of make it manageable. And medication is one small part of that. And I also say I'm well-controlled. And it's likely anything will happen because people are always worried about what will happen. And I've noticed some people don't even want to be around me um, if they think I'm tired or they think something might, might happen. So I, <laughs> the part about doing many things to control my narcolepsy is something I stress more now because people used to say, oh, you're on medication. Isn't that better? And you, um, did you take your medication? Uh, you know, so it was almost this disbelief thing, uh, as well as, you know, questioning me about, am I doing everything I need to do? And then, of course, there were the people who asked me if I was taking the right herbs and vitamins and everything else, cut this out, do this, do that. So now I tell people the quick and dirty um textbook version if they ask more I'm always very pleased to tell them more and if they're kind of a sciencey geek like I am and they want to know you know a bit about pathophysiology then that's really exciting but if it's somebody who's perhaps traveling with me or I'm biking with them or something like this and they may be in a situation where I will have cataplexy or um, you know, be really sleepy and need a nap or need to take a preemptive nap, then I will tell them a little bit more, quite a bit more than I used to. So what I'll often say, I'll, I'll still joke a bit and I'll say, you know, if I have a little, you know, a little spell, it's actually called cataplexy or I might get sleepy. I explain that cataplexy is you know, when I explain what REM is when you're sleeping at night, um, usually people think it's really cool that you get paralyzed uh, when you dream. And then I'll say, as I get older, I do worry that, you know, like anybody else, I could have a heart attack, I could have a stroke, you know, there are other um, things as you get older that you're at higher risk for. And I certainly would not want to, um, you know, end up in a crisis, a medical crisis, because people assumed that I was just sleepy or assumed that I was having cataplexy if they knew what it was. So now I say, if for, for instance, I go down or I am suddenly needing to sleep and I'm not responding, please check my pulse and make sure I'm breathing normally and have a look at my color. You know, you don't need really need to know anything. You don't need to be a doctor. And again, I'm making them feel comfortable. I will say, just make sure I'm not blue or I'm not pale. You know, most of the time, that's not an issue. And sometimes people will get overwhelmed and they'll say, well, how do I know if it's cataplexy or if it's a sleep attack? And in that case, I say, you don't really need to know that. Um, you just need to kind of know what you're looking at. Because for me, I will sometimes have cataplexy and then I'll go into a sleep afterwards after I have a full body. So I may still be on the ground. I can hear you, 
but then I get very tired at the end of that and I may have a short nap. So I say, don't worry about it. Just kind of go by how I look. And the most important thing I say, if they're overwhelmed, I don't even get into a lot of that, to be honest. I just say, you know what, if, if I look like I'm having a little spell, because people often call it a spell or an attack, I'll say, just stay close by for my safety. You know, I, I'll come out of it in a minute, you know, minute or two tops, most likely. I tell people if I've fallen and obviously hurt myself to act accordingly. So I'm, for instance, in a couple months, six weeks, wow, I'm going to Tucson hiking um, with friends for two weeks and um, just to see the sites. And my friends who are there are nurses, but even my friends who are in the medical field don't understand this well. So I will tell them this and I will say, you know, if I fall and I've obviously hurt myself during one of these um, things, if, you know, I happen to have one, you know, you need to treat that injury like you would anybody else. Don't just, you know, ignore it kind of thing. So everybody would be different, obviously. I have had a, a prolonged cataplexy um, several years ago that lasted 20 minutes. And it was actually, a, you know, a very abnormal situation that I won't get into. But as a rule, it's usually seconds to a couple of minutes. So I tell people, you know what, like, if, if my color is off or I'm not breathing right, or your gut feeling is telling you this is something else that you're concerned, then, you know, just treat me like you would anybody else. Call 911. You know, I'm not going to be embarrassed. I'm not going to be angry, but play the safe side. And I still care about the other person. And for instance, when I go see my friends, I will say, you know what? let's just have this talk before the two weeks starts. I just kind of want you to know this is the deal. I have this written out in my wallet card. I have a medic alert. It is up to date. I've signed, like I've made it up to date for three years. Um, you need to know that this is a possibility, but it's still not a very um, common thing for me. I can go months, you know, but if I'm in a new situation and I'm taxing myself, especially if it's hot and I'm, you know, doing physical activity, it is more of a chance that I could have cataplexy. So I'm more assertive and I use less humor than I used to. And that's mainly to make people realize that, you know, this isn't a big deal, but you do need to know about it and, you know, act accordingly. So the hardest thing for me, and I've heard this from other people, um, friends with narcolepsy and people in support groups, the hardest thing is to figure out every situation and every person and how much do you tell. And this may be a job, it may be um, when you're dating, it may be a new friend. And all of us want to feel safe and secure and we want to feel you know, respected and we want to feel valued and but as well, we want to feel that we belong. And when you stand out as somebody really different or potentially somebody that might scare people, if you have seizures or cataplexy or something like that, um, then you really find, I find myself in a situation where I think I'm always weighing these things out. So on the one hand, you know, there are situations where I'm like, I'm going to tell, you know, the whole truth. <laughs> I'm going to be, you know, real about this. And it takes a lot of energy to do that. And I do find that I'm always patting myself on the back, like that was brave, you know, of you, especially when I was younger. There are still situations where I'll mask it and I'll deny it and I'll disguise it um, if I don't feel, you know, that I'm in a position where they need to know or a position where um, I need to kind of inform them. But sometimes it's based on fear. It's just, I'm not comfortable and I don't want to deal with rejection. I don't want that stigma. I don't want to be judged. And I don't want, I don't have the energy to deal with another person's feelings about what I'm going through. And again, everything is, every situation is very different. So as I get older and perhaps as I understand this more too, and, I, and I'm comfortable with how narcolepsy manifest, if you will, in my own body, I'm more comfortable to talk about my hallucinations, my issues with time management, fragmented sleep, brain fog, difficulty concentrating. And 
a lot of people have difficulty understanding that there are days, but I can't predict this. There are days that I can't do anything before 11 in the morning. And it does take a mental health toll. So I really work hard at keeping, you know, all the things, you know, that everybody should be doing um, to keep themselves in check as far as their mental health. And I have seen um, a psychologist um, and I, and I really think that, you know, there's definitely a place for this. I wish there were many more psychologists who understand sleep disorders, uh, but I have not found that to be the case, um, at least around here we end up educating them like we often do physicians. So interestingly, I'm, I'm finding myself in the world of dating again, um, at the age of 60 and I'm going slow, but keeping in mind that cataplexy, my cataplexy most often has been full body. It can be very dramatic and that there are certain emotions that really drive my cataplexy and I will have breakthrough even with my medications that normally work well, especially if I haven't slept well the night before. So when do you tell somebody that you're dating, that you have this disorder? Do you tell them? How do you tell them? How much, how much detail? And, you know, I'm not an expert. This is just my experience in my limited, um, experience of dating after 40 years of being out of the dating pool. So I think ideally I would like to meet somebody through word of mouth or through friends. And part of that is the safety thing. And I think even without narcolepsy, that would be my personality, but cataplexy and sleep attacks certainly bring it to a different level. And I think if I was on sodium oxidate and, you know, heavier, you know, medications lying around and things that that would be something I would think about as well. We all know that the dating um, world has moved to online for the most part, and the pandemic has certainly um, made this more of a necessity, I would say. So there, most apps have the option of texting within the app. Um, and I have made a point of staying within the app, um, including until I've met the person in person. And then I will decide whether I will move to text or sharing a phone number. But I'm very guarded with my personal information. And as they recommend, I would only meet in a public place until I got to know somebody well. And the social media, um, social media has certainly made it easier to dig into, you know, a potential person that might be in your area. And I've certainly done that. And I've found people by their first name. (laughs) And I think, you know what, that's just being, that's just being, you know, extra careful and looking out for your own safety. Once you've decided that you want to meet a person um, and you've decided that, you know, the risk, if you will, is worth it. I would say, you know, take your time. Don't just jump into a relationship, ask around, see if anybody knows them, kind of get a feeling for, you know, who they are, their character whether you feel you can trust them, this thing, and as well, trust your gut. I think at the beginning of a relationship, I think um, myself anyway, you know, you, you want to have a companion, you want to have somebody to do things with, but so we will often, you know, even with spouses and whenever at the beginning, you're like, okay, that's a one-off. I'm just going to ignore that. But I think it's even more important for us to not ignore those things because often those little, you know, gut nudges are, are for a reason. So I, I will be paying attention to my, um, my gut, if you will. So recently I decided that I would go on a couple coffee dates, if you will. Um, and I'm really disclosing in here, but um, no people's names or anything. But I decided that I would not tell a person um, that I had narcolepsy until I got to know them online, if I was talking for a bit and after a couple of weeks or whatever, if I felt that they were somebody that, you know, they check all my boxes and I'm feeling comfortable, then I was going to tell them about narcolepsy. Then if you tell them too early, I just feel like I would be scaring people off most people anyway. And there's really nothing for them to, you know, potentially even be interested at all. Right. That if they can find somebody, you know, who has the same attributes or whatever, and they don't have this um, hanging over them, then, you know, it just seems like a no brainer. 
So I decided that I would tell once I got to the point that I wanted to meet this person in person. So the first one that I, I, I will tell you about, and I've only been um, out with a couple people. We had been talking for about three weeks. We really got along. We actually had some of the same connections, um, same interests. And he actually said, you know, we should go out to supper. Or we should go out for coffee. And I'm like, yeah, sure. So we made that decision and I was good with that. But I did say to him, there is something that I want to tell you. Um, and I just think it's important you know, it's not necessarily anything that, you know, you'd have to worry about on a date, but I won't date anybody unless they know about this. So I told this person about my narcolepsy um, and the history, and he was actually willing to listen to the, um, the podcast uh, that I did, which you know, talks a lot of detail about my cataplexy and, and my journey. And I was really nervous and he didn't get back to me right away. He said, Oh, I'm going to go and listen to him right now. And he did get back to me within like a half an hour after it. And he was actually really compassionate. He was interested. He asked me questions about it. He felt that I was brave speaking out. And for me, that was like, Oh, okay. All right. You know, because this is new territory for me. I, I had a partner for a long time who went through this whole thing with me and understood it or <laughs> kind of understood it. So uh, we did go to supper. Once we had the narcolepsy thing behind us, it was great because I didn't have to worry. You know, for the first couple of weeks, I was thinking, oh my gosh, do I tell them is this going to go anywhere? Do, you know, should I say anything? Am I like withholding this, you know, it's protection, but um, am I being dishonest by not disclosing this? But it was really obvious to me when it got to the point that I, I needed to disclose this. Um, we, we ended up not seeing each other again. Um, we've remained friends and we speak. But for me, it was a real learning experience. And it, it was a good trial um, in terms of how I will deal with that in the future. And I've decided that if somebody can't deal with um, knowing about my narcolepsy before we meet, then I'm not going to meet. It's, you know, it's just to me, that's a pretty um, easy decision. And everybody, of course, would be totally different. We all have, um, you know, we're all different, right? So that's just my example. So looking ahead, um, I when I look at working in neuroscience in the early 80s, I could not get enough of neuroscience. I went to every neuro conference, I read everything I could get my hands on, and I just thought the brain was fascinating. We didn't really talk about sleep. We talked about sleep in terms of parents who were having trouble, trouble coping with their children's disorders and, you know, just around supporting them. But we didn't really talk about sleep a lot with our patients. And I think that's changing. And I, I'm really excited about all the new medications coming down the line and all the research that's going on. I think it's a really, really exciting time to be part of, um, you know, even if you're, you know, you have this disorder, but kind of watching it, it grow over the last 30 years has been very exciting. The support groups for me um, is something that I think I will always be part of um, in some capacity because they're accessible, you know, the wake up narcolepsy ones are free, they're easy to access. And it's the way to connect with other people. And it's not just about troubleshooting or talking about medication or talking about how bad our week was, we really become, um, you know, a tight community that cares about each other, I believe. And you see the same people coming back time and time again. And I've, I've really enjoyed that it's been very helpful. There's so much education out there that I think it's really exciting. Um, there's toolkits on every aspect. There are support groups for parents, support groups for pregnant people, um, for teens. And it, you know, it's just the sky's the limit, right? And I think that, you know, it's really important to recognize that we are a part of a rare disease group that is, you know, specific to us is one, approximately one in 2000 people, but there's a whole huge rare disease community out there. And we are one small, if you will, rare disease within that broader, um, you know, bigger world out there. And when I spoke to this guy, going back to the date, he actually disclosed that he has an autoimmune disorder. And we talked a little bit about that. And 
although it's not as dramatic as say as having cataplexy in public or on a date, um, it was something that I think he felt better that he, I kind of gave him that door to open. And um, we are not alone or narcolepsy not alone, I think is, um, you know, a really important thing to remember that we're not um, just out there in an island, we're amongst many people who have this disorder. And I think I've stayed within my half an hour. Um, we, we do have uh, time for questions. And I'm going to stop sharing here. And thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity today. Sheila, thank you. Wonderful presentation. And I appreciate you sharing your personal experience with dating and relationships <laughs> because we don't hear that too often. No. <laughs> um, so thank you. A couple of questions here. Um, since narcolepsy is a chronic lifelong condition, has anyone in Canada been able to secure the disability tax credit with the Canada Revenue Agency? Who? Um, one of the physicians might be better off answering that. Um, I don't I didn't get it myself, but I was put on disability through my employer. And I was told by friends that it would be very difficult to do, that nobody can get a disability. And I was um, accepted immediately. Okay. Um, there was no questions asked. They filled out the form and it came back like within two weeks, I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing your journey and insight, Sheila. Can you say more about the warning signs you noticed before cataplexy? Sure. Uh, my lighting's changed here. It's gotten really bright, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay. What, probably the first thing I noticed is that I have trouble with word finding, but I also have trouble with word finding when I'm tired. Like today, I, I just, it's a little bit harder to kind of hang on to those words and find them. I will start with that. And then if I'm having trouble with word finding, and then I also feel that I'm just having uh, trouble focusing those are kind of signs but then I might also have trouble with my speech so I will not slur my speech but it's just not as clear it's just a little bit more effort or something it, it's hard to explain I will often get a headache um, which I don't think I really clued into before and it's not like a bad headache it's just like my head doesn't feel right and then I will go into, uh, if, if it's imminent, I, I will start feeling a bit weak overall and I will be nauseous. So once I have trouble word finding and I'm finding I'm having brain fog and it, my brain is not as clear as far as doing anything cognitive, then I know often I, I need to have a nap. Thank you. Would you be able to hold comfortable share, sharing your experience with medications or other interventions and how your regimen has evolved over the life, life of your diagnosis? Sure. So because I was treated for epilepsy for 20 years, I was on five anti-seizure meds over that period of time. I had a lot of issues with, um, with side effects um, always trying to increase doses, you know, I, I'd be on more than one, they would change me over. Um, and then I'd be worse kind of in between. Some of them affected my sleep. And, and it's really interesting to think about that. And, and, you know, the ones that made me really drowsy, maybe I was sleeping more at night, and my symptoms were better. But I kind of became shy about medication. So I'm really fortunate that the first two medications that they put me on for narcolepsy, I'm on venlafaxin, uh, or Effexor and modafinil, and they do work fairly well. I can't, I do have to nap frequently, and I do have to pace myself and, this, you know, my health in terms of eating well, if I eat too many carbs, uh, I'm much sleepier and my narcolepsy seems to be worse. So um, I, I like to try some of the new drugs because I think I probably could be better. But because of my history, I've been on 11 medications in total um, over the years. I think I'm just a little bit shy of, you know, I, I, I'm good enough and I don't want to go down that road <laughs> right now. I just, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. How about, um, we would love to hear about how your narcolepsy ha symptoms has have evolved over time. Have you noticed that any of them have leveled off or changed? And when were they most severe? That type of mm -hmm. 
So I think my cataplexy is better, but I'm not sure that it's that my cataplexy is better or that I am much more aware. You know, I will sometimes say that cataplexy or narcolepsy brings mindfulness to a whole other level because I'm checking in with my body, you know, and I sometimes feel like I'm on this four or five hour kind of turnaround because my, my modafinil after four or five hours is not as effective. And I will take my second dose of modafinil late morning if I didn't say it was on that. So, and before the first dose is kind of teetering off, I, before it goes all the way down, I will take the second one, but there is a period where it has to come up. And in that kind of period in the day, I have to be really careful because I feel like it wouldn't take a lot for me to have narcolepsy and or to have cataplexy. Um, I'm not sure it has gotten better. I certainly have less, but I think it has more to do with I'm retired. I'm not working in a job where I'm going flat out and I'm not taking breaks. I'm not taking meals. I'm not you know, um, all those things. So it's, it's really hard to tell Mm -hmm. sleepiness for me. I think I'm more brain fog and I think I have more inattention than I did. I definitely have much more difficulty with attention than I did when I was younger. Okay. Thank you. Shelly, one last question, unless any other ones come through, um, thinking back, are there any things, any, is there anything you would do differently? Mm Mm-hmm. That's always a tricky question because you only know what you know. And in that moment, I always feel like I did the best I could with what I knew at the time. So I I tried to be a really good historian when I spoke to my doctors and I was telling them everything. And I you know, tried to be a good advocate for myself. And I think I would stress that with other people, you know, don't, don't be shy, speak up for yourself. And the one thing I did really well, and I don't know that there is anything that I would change, but the one thing I think I did really well was when I was speaking to people and they would say to me, are you sure you're just not depressed? (laughs) Are you sure it's not just your, like, you're in a really stressful job, you know, you're raising two kids. And I'm like, yeah, well, so is half, you know, half of the city or whatever. And I stuck to my guns and I would say, no, I am not like, I, I feel down because this is frustrating because nobody knows what's wrong with me. Um, but I I'm not depressed. Like, you know, and people would try to tell me that it was my job. A few of the first doctors when I was like 21 would say, well, it's a very stressful job. And I'm like, I love my job. Like I love to get up and go to my job. So, you know, that's not really how somebody who's depressed and doesn't like their job, you know, presents. So I stuck to my guns. I didn't let people put words in my mouth. I didn't let people tell me that I was something different than I was. And I think you know, in the long, it took a while, but I think in the long run that that helped me. Excellent. Thank you, Sheila, for sharing. Any final questions for Sheila? Okay. Well, thanks so much, Sheila. And um, I will talk to you soon. I appreciate your time and and all of your experience that you shared. Thank you. Thank you.